We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to be presenting the basics of tax research today. I'll be with uh, Charlie Beckin and myself. I'm Christopher Brown. And I think, I guess we need to get through some reminders to keep your mute, your mics muted. Um, you need to stay on logged on for the entire session. Uh, you got to make sure you submit your surveys at the end of the presentation and i think we'll wait till the end to try to address any questions um you can uh put those in the chat box along the way just so they're there but i think we'll go ahead and get started um, counting us we have 16 participants all right thank you all so this this presentation, we're going to be kind of going over the basic uh, authorities that you're going to want to use to do some tax research and do a little bit about the siting. Um, kind of kind of kind of going to follow a, a a college class almost like, but uh, I figured if we we're going to cover a variety of topics, but we didn't we don't get too deep into them, but I wanted to touch on them just to to let everyone uh, know about them. And in the slideshow, I think would be pretty good uh, reference for people after it if they want to have a look back at it. But uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So there's three types of tax research, basically. Um, the first of which would be planning research. This is obviously before an event or uh, before a client takes action. Um, you'll do a lot of these, you know, towards the end of the year. Um, then you'll have compliance research. This is after the fact research. Uh, typically, this pops up when you're preparing a return or during an audit. Um, obviously, the transaction's complete, so there's less flexibility involved. Um, then we also have policy research. I haven't done that much of this myself. Um, but basically it involves analyzing different tax reform proposals or research to influence legislation. Yeah, I would chime in on that last one um, preceding slide that my experience has been a lot of the compliance research during busy season. Um, sometimes you can anticipate and do some planning research. But oftentimes that'll give you a general idea of what to expect, but then when you get to the return, um, it, it might get tweaked a little bit uh, when you put it on the forms and deal with the issue at hand. And the policy research, I guess that's, that's like the updates we're seeing now with uh, President-elect Biden, I, guess, I suppose, uh, with the Electoral College, uh, declaring him the winner. Uh, some of what um, the new administration may propose. Thank you. All right. So the basic tax research steps, obviously you're going to want to identify the facts, you're going to determine issues or questions, you're going to want to search for authorities, then you're going to analyze the authorities, uh, develop conclusions and recommendations, and then obviously communicate your results. So the first step is to identify all of the relevant facts. You're going to want to make sure you get all of these so you're addressing the issue properly. Um, step two, you're going to want to determine the issues or questions. Is there tax? Is it taxable? Is it deductible? How much? Are there thresholds? Are there limits? What's the character? And we're going to go through some of the tax positions. So frivolous, obviously, you want to stay away from that. And when I talk about tax position, I'm talking about when you're on a return and you decide to take a tax uh, position on, say, a deduction. Um, this is what we're talking about and the different levels that are required. But obviously, a frivolous one, you're not going to want to take that position. And they, that's basically considered uh, you have a 5% chance or less of 
your position being upheld if it's challenged. Um, so we'll stay away from that one. Um, a reasonable basis is if a taxpayer will not be subject to an understatement penalty if the position is adequate, adequate, eh, adequate, eh, I can't pronounce today, adequately disclosed on the return using form 8275, which is a disclosure statement. Um, that's about a 20% or less. Realistic possibility if met, a taxpayer may take a, a tax preparer may take a particular position and sign the return. If the standard is not met, the taxpayers and the taxpayer's position is not frivolous, the tax preparer may still return sign the return, but must disclose it adequately on the return on a form 8275. That's about a 33 um, percent. Yeah, this is the one that we back really... to that preceding slide. Just I'll add a comment. Um, yeah. I think it was. Earlier this week. I talked to Glenn. And. Um, we could not recall Hansman Weeble. Inserting a form 8275 disclosure statement into a tax return. So what that means is that we had a have had a pretty high percentage, well above 33%, that uh, the tax position we're taking is correct or will be sustained upon audit. So we could not recall ever seeing that form 8275 in a Hansman-Weeble return, but Glenn did point out he has seen form 8275 in say a uh, partnership return prepared by another firm that may be one of our clients is a partner in that partnership. Thank you. Gotcha. And that's what I was kind of getting to. What we're looking for, we're looking for substantial authority. Um, this is a when you have this type of authority, you can go ahead and take the position on your return and you also do not have to disclose it on the return. So basically we want to hit this 40% um, or higher. That's what we're looking for. We don't want to even deal with any of the stuff below it. And like Charlie just mentioned, obviously we haven't really ran into that in the past. So this is the level that we want to get to. Uh, the more likely than not, this is for tax shelters, reportable transactions, and listed transactions as defined by the code. Uh, most meet this must meet this standard before taking a position on a return. And then I entered this slide. This was I put in more as a reference point for people if they want to come back to the PowerPoint. It, it delves a little deeper into what the last couple of slides and provides a lot of good information, but we're not going to go through all that today. I'll add on that slide that uh, one thing that will make you a little nervous is when you look in the far right column, the um, potential of a prepare penalty as well as a taxpayer penalty. I think the prepare penalty of maybe it's something like 20% of the understatement if um, your client were to get audited and there was a big adjustment, then we as prepare could get that penalty potentially. Thank you. Gotcha. All right, so step three, we're going to want to locate authority. Um, there's two different types. You have primary authority. This is the official body of tax law consists of the internal revenue code as drafted by Congress, regulations and other pronouncements of the Department of the Treasury. This is the IRS and judicial decisions devoted to tax issues. Secondary authority are unofficial sources of tax information such as textbooks, journal articles, commentaries and tax service editorial comments. Um, while secondary authority is very helpful and informative, you cannot rely on it solely to justify a tax position on a return. I'll chime in on that slide that um, here in the internet world, um, 
Well, let me back up. I say when I first started out, you would dive into like the tax service for the primary authority looking for that official tax law. Nowadays, at least for me, to get to that official body of tax law, um, quite frankly, I might do a Google search. And in that Google search, the results might be a journal article or from, a, you know, like the tax advisor or the journal of accountancy. And fortunately, within those articles, there are footnotes which will cite the uh, tax law, so then you can get to your primary authority. It's really kind of hard to find that primary authority starting out, to me at least. It's, it's, it's easier to find the keyword search, Google, and then from there in that journal article, then I can go to the code or the regs or the revenue ruling, some of these things that Chris is going to go into in a little while. Thank you, Chris. Yes, Charlie, you mentioned it's exactly the first thing I do usually when I'm trying to research something is to Google it. <laughs> uh, but like Charlie said, it can take you to articles which will will oftentimes there's links in them that will bring you to a primary authority which you'll be able to cite. Um, but I was talking to Jim uh, Hutcherson, a partner at Hanson Weevil about this, and he said uh, that's often quite how, often how he begins his research too is just at least at the beginning to Google it and see what he finds. But ultimately you do want to get to a primary authority. So basically this is kind of a breakdown of the, the different uh, locations of the authorities. Uh, legislative or statutory authority, that's the Congress. So the House of Representatives and the Senate. Executive authority is the Treasury Department, which is basically the IRS. Um, and judicial, obviously, that's the courts. And I think we just kind of touched on this secondary authorities, uh, you know, tax services, tax journals, textbooks, news, newsletters, Google. I bolded that because that's where I start. And I think a lot of us probably do. Um, and then other, other unofficial sources. And once again, you can't rely on these solely, but they oftentimes will point you in the right direction to find some primary authorities. Oh, and our first code word is character. I guess you might want to go ahead and drop that into the survey. OK, so we're going to move on. So legis excuse me, legislative authorities, other, otherwise known as statutory, this consists of the Constitution, the Internal Revenue Code, and that's where we're going to be spending most of our time for, on this section. At. Um, there's also tax treaties that the president can enter the United States into. As I mentioned, the Constitution, the 16th Amendment basically gave Congress the power to lay down taxes and collect them. So US Code Title 26, this is the Internal Revenue Code. Um, legislative authority refers to tax authority enacted by Congress. Tax bills are passed by Congress and added to Title 26 of the U.S. Code and have the force and effect of the law unless found unconstitutional. Legislative authority also includes committee, committee reports issued by various tax writing committees in Congress as well as tax treaties involving the United States. I found this slide I found this slide a, a bit amusing because Title 26, the Internal Revenue Code, right after it, they have Title 27, intoxicating liquors. <laughs> so I found that a bit amusing. And here we go with the organization of the Internal Revenue Code. Once again, this is Title 26 of the US, US Code. 
Um, you're going to have subtitles, chapters, subchapters, parts and subparts, and then sections and subsections. Se sections and subsections, that's the meat and potatoes of it all. That's what you're usually going to end up citing from the IRC. So we're gonna, we'll touch briefly on the other four, but we want to get to the sections and subsections. So subtitles are identified by a letter. For example, subtitle A is income tax, subtitle B is estate and gift taxes. Chapters, chapters are organized by a unique number. So subtitle A, income taxes, you'd have chapter one, normal taxes and surtaxes, Ta chapter two, tax on self-employment income, and so on and so forth. Then you can have sub chapters. And by the way, not all of these go are broken down this far, but sometimes they are. But sub chapters are identified by a capital letter. Um, examples of this would be A, determination of tax liability, B, computation of taxable income. Um, this would be inside of a uh, Subtitle A, Income Taxes, Chapter 1, Normal Taxes. And we get to parts and subparts. This is basically groupings, groupings addressing essentially the same issue. Not all, once again, not all subchapters are divided into parts, but some examples could be uh, Part 1, Definition of Gross Income, AGI, taxable income, part two, items specifically included in gross income. Uh, part three, items specifically excluded from gross income. And subparts are used to further subs, uh, excuse me, further divide large parts. I didn't want to spend too much time on this because this is where the meat and potatoes is basically sections and subsections. It's the primary unit of the code. Uh, these are the ones that you're going to see cited usually if you look things up in articles and such. Um, but section numbers are used only once and sections may be further subdivided. Uh, subsections are a lowercase letter. letter Paragraphs are an Arabic number. Subparagraphs are a capital letter. Clauses are lowercase Roman numerals. And subclauses are uppercase numeral. And this last point below is kind of like what I told you is typically no reference is made to the title, subtitle, chapter, subchapter, or part when referencing the code. I'm going to start with the sections. And here I just put an example of a an IRS, IRC section. As you can see, it, it has section 121. It's broken down into subsections, and then there's paragraphs under the subsections, and you can break it down into subparagraphs and clauses even further. So uh, legislative authority, a tax treaties, this is another source of legislative authority. The president may enter into a treaty with another country and such a treaty is considered having the force and effect of law once approved with advice and consent of the Senate. It takes a two thirds vote. Uh, most treaties are designed obviously to eliminate double taxation between countries. Uh, courts tend to give equal weight to both the code and treaties uh, when they're when there are conflicts, courts usually assume the one adopted later controls the issue. And we get to committee reports. Committee reports are useful in determining the intent of Congress behind tax laws. Basically, committee reports are, are produced when Congress is debating different tax laws. Um, committee reports are written by the House House Ways and Means Committee, the Senate Finance Committee, and oftentimes the Joint Committee of, on Taxation. Um, they are substantial authority, so once again, that's another thing that we're looking for. We want to find substantial authority. Uh, 
you can also find these. You can find these committee reports at the various uh, government websites. Typically, you're probably going to find them in tax services such as Thompson Reuters Checkpoint. Yeah, I'll add on that one that um, we highlighted the word intent because sometimes when you get these new laws like Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, a lot of commentators and tax people were reading the uh, committee reports, um, mostly to derive the intent of what the law actually means. And, and um, I think even now some are looking at the PPP loans and saying that the intent of Congress was to make the expenses deductible and the IRS has come out and said that, you know, if the loan's forgiven, then the expenses are non-deductible. So some have looked to the committee reports for an answer, but uh, that's still up in the air. But uh, I want to say in the services, you'll see the tax code, the new, the new law, like when it, when it came to Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and then immediately after the services will usually publish at least that joint committee and then they may have the house ways and means and a lot of times they'll say like uh, the house adopts the senate finance committee and and they go with that or sometimes it'll be a again a joint come together and work out the differences uh, committee report so that's just something interesting to read it's usually a, a few pages or more and Chris mentioned the um, RA checkpoint. I use that a good bit. And there's also BNA. And uh, Glenn told me that BNA is is available to everyone in the firm if you can get a uh, username and password. But everyone is entitled to that because I believe that's what the firm is paying for. Thanks, Chris. Awesome. So we'll move on to executive authority. This is administrative sources. This is basically the Treasury Department. Um, the Treasury Department administers US tax laws, enforces tax statutes, and collects tax revenue. Um, the Secretary of the Treasury is a member of the Presidential Cabinet. Um, ultimately, this falls on the IRS, which is the division of the Treasury Department. Uh, once again, the commissioner is appointed by the president. Uh, many of the Treasury's administrative functions are delegated to the IRS. So administrative authority regulations are the Treasury Department's official interpretations of the code. And basically there's three types of general uh, regulations. <coughs> Excuse me. These are proposed, final, and temporary. Yeah. Went too far there. All right. So final, regu final regulations represent the Treasury and the IRS's ultimate interpretation of the code. They are the highest authority issued by the Treasury. They are published in the Federal Register as a weekly as eh, excuse me as a treasury decision and then in the weekly internal revenue bulletin ultimately they end up in the semi-annual cumulative bulletin and we move on to temporary and proposed regulation temporary regulations are basically provided to give immediate guidance to taxpayers um, as you can imagine at getting a final regulation passed is can be a long process so they they often use temporary regulations because they don't have to go through the huge process and it at least gives the taxpayer some immediate guidance on issues that uh, they feel that need to be addressed uh, immediately um, they do hold the same weight as a final regulation and remain in effect until they're superseded by a final regulation or expire after three years um, all temporary, this is fairly new, I believe, but all temporary regulations are also issued as proposed regulations. Um, proposed regulations do not have the effect of law, but do show the IRS's thinking on an issue. It sounds a little funny because they're saying that all temporary uh, 
regulations are also issued as proposed regulations and they're saying proposed regulations don't have the effect of law. But I think technically you can have a temporary regulation expire and it'll still be a proposed regulation. So I think that's what they're trying to refer to there. Then we have tax regulation types. Um, the first one, legislative. Um, Congress basically directs the IRS to provide details for certain tax statutes. Uh, they're basically telling uh, the IRS they want uh, them to let the, the public know what they need to know about it. But it carries the same authority as statutes. Interpretive, these regulations attempt to clarify a particular code section. They don't hold as much weight as legislative regulations, but nonetheless can be relied upon unless they're challenged. And then you have procedural. These are basically provide detailed procedural rules for various aspects of tax practice. So citing, we're not going to get too deep into this, but citing regulations is kind of the basics. Uh, the first number is the type of regulation. And I can actually show you that and we have some different types of regulation like one is income tax, 20 is a state tax, 25 gift tax, 31 employment tax. But that's what you're seeing here. This one, that's the income tax. So the second number is going to be your IRS section. Um, the third number is going to be your regulation number. And if you see a T in the citation, that means it's a temporary regulation which you can remember you can rely upon. Um, proposed regulations use the abbreviation PROP and obviously you'll see that in the citation like shown here. And the reg number in this case is dash one on that 732 is the code section. Yeah, yeah. But you know you could have a code section that just has one digit or two digits, but the point is, it says third number, but it's actually the, the number that follows the dash. Is ah, yeah, I, I see right. what you're saying, yeah. All right, so we went through the types. Obviously, there's many more types of regulations here. I just put some examples. Um, but here's an example of a, <coughs> of a regulation as you can see, it gives you the type of regulation one equals income tax. Then you have the related code section, the regulation number. And like the code, regulations can be further broken down into paragraphs, subparagraphs, etc. Oh, so on that preceding slide, now all of us know why that uh, penalties end up on M1, Schedule M1 of business returns. Deduction on the books, not on the return, because you can't deduct it on the return because of this 1.162-21. No deduction, fines and penalties. Thank you, Chris. We'll move on to revenue rulings. Revenue rulings are official IRS interpretations. They explain the application of the code to specific factual situations, obviously using a hypothetical taxpayer. Um, revenues rulings do not have the force and effect of regulations, but can be relied upon if the facts of the case substantially match that of a revenue ruling. So once again, you'll have to find to, 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 to use this as a substantial authority. You'll want to find a revenue ruling that kind of matches your, your situation and what you're researching. Um, there's quite a few out there, and obviously part of this is professional judgment. And um, oftentimes in court cases, people will bring revenue rulings in with them. And it really kind of depends on the facts of the case. But as long as you feel you can match that 40%, then you, you, you'll at least stay away from penalties and you're not going to get in trouble with the IRS, even though you might lose. Yeah, and here with the revenue rulings um, is where the B&A tax service or the uh, RIA checkpoint will help you because those two services 
when they mention a rev ruling, they will outright mention it, or they might mention it and say revoked or superseded yeah. or modified. And oftentimes they will give you the next revenue ruling that did that. So then you'll know if you're looking at a valid up to date revenue ruling by using the tax services. Yes, and Charlie, that's an excellent point that Charlie brought up. Um, so citing revenue rulings, revenue rulings are first published in the weekly internal revenue bulletin, and then they're eventually added to the semi-annual cumulative bulletin. Uh, for this reason, there's two types of citations. Uh, one of them is the temporary one, which is the internal revenue bulletin. This is the weekly one. Uh, the first number is the uh, the first number is the year. It's four digits. Uh, prior to 2000, it was only two. You'll find that with a lot of these citations. Um, the second number is weekly issue number of the Internal Revenue Bulletin. And the third is the page number. Uh, we have, then you have the cumulative bulletin citation. The first number, once again, is the year. The second number is the ruling number. The third number is the volume of the cumulative bulletin. And the fourth number is the page number. Uh, a useful tool that you can use is the IRS's Bulletin Index Digest system. It organizes rev rulings and revenue procedures by code section. Um, it also has finding list and provides a brief summary of each of the rulings and procedures. So. It's a quick go to just to try and look up something and then you can look further into that. Hey, Chris, I think that uh, up here on third floor in the connector, if you were to be if you were to get water from the water fountain and then look down to the bottom shelf on your left, I think we may still have the cumulative voltage from about 1916 to 1959. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a little trivia for you. <laughs> we, have, we have a have a scavenger hunt in the office. <laughs> All right, so here's some examples of revenue ruling citations. Uh, this first one, that would be the 40th ruling in 1999, found in the 48th weekly issue of the 1999 Internal Revenue Bulletin on page five. Uh, the second one is from the Cumulative Bulletin, and this one is a little easier. This one would be found on page 60 of the second cumulative bulletin of 1999. Um, like I said before, after 2000, they expanded the year to include four digits. You'll find that a common theme in all these citations. And we move on to revenue procedures. Revenue procedures deal with the internal practice and procedures of the IRS and the administration of tax laws. They are official statements of procedures relating to sections of the IRC, related statutes, tax treaties, and regulations. Um, they basically are telling taxpayers how to do something. Um, they do hold the same authority as revenue rulings. Yeah, on the rev prox is what they're typically called. Um, I see a lot of those in um, the accounting method world, um, like after Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, when so many of our clients were able to switch from accrual to cash, uh, that was all promulgated in a rev proc on how to do that. I think here recently with the, um, as David pointed out, the correction of the retail glitch on the qualified improvement property uh, with the inadvertent, it, it was 39 years and, and got corrected to the intended 15 years with the CARES Act. Uh, the CARES Act passed that law and then there was a rev proc, I believe, issued to tell us how to do it, whether to go back, you can amend a return, the rev proc says, or you can do a form 3115 in your current year return. So that guidance is all I believe coming from a rep proc. Thank you. I had to. Um, so in the interest of time, we're not going to spend too much time on this slide, but citing revenue procedures is pretty much the same procedure as uh, revenue rulings. 
Um, obviously, you can have a look at this slide and reference it, but it's pretty much exactly the same. And you have private letter rulings. These are issued by the IRS in response to a specific taxpayer issue. Uh, private letter ruling is issued only to the requesting taxpayer and may only be relied upon as authority by that taxpayer. Ironically, though, as you can see this red part, it is on the list of substantial authorities, even though they say that it can't be relied on by other people. Um, they also do provide insight into the IRS thinking on certain issues. Yeah, and back to uh, private letter rulings. I, when I spoke to Glenn, I remember a, a number of years ago that um, he actually did a private letter ruling for a client that had had a uh, inadvertent escort termination. And so he requested the private letter ruling. He wrote a letter to the IRS, laid out the facts and that it was inadvertent and the IRS came back and um, approved the request and said, Okay, you can have your S-Corp status back retroactive to, for our client. And um, there is a fee involved with that. I think it was maybe $11,000 at the time, but it was pretty big dollars uh, associated with that inadvertent termination if it uh, had happened. Thank you. So private, ah, private letter ruling citations. Um, these are basically done two ways. They're basically the same, but this first way, 86 is the year, 51 is the 51st week of the year, and the 012 represents the 12th ruling of that week. In 2000 and beyond, they basically just extended or used the four digits like the other, these other sightings I was telling you about to, to cite uh, PLRs. Um, and again, most tax servers have complete text of all uh, private letter rulings. Then you have TAMs. These are tax advice memoranda. It's another type of letter ruling issued by the IRS. It's typically requested by IRS director or appeals officer regarding a technical question arising from an audit. It involves a completed transaction and like a T, uh, excuse me, like a PLR, a TAM is based on a specific taxpayer situation and may only be relied upon by that taxpayer as authority. TAMs are, are cited in the same fashion as uh, private letter rulings. And now we have the second code word deduction. If you want to drop that into your survey. All right, everyone got that deduction. We'll move on to our final one, judicial authority. This is obviously uh, refers to decisions of the federal courts on tax matters. Um, Courts of origination would be the U.S. Tax Court, the U.S. District Court, and the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. Um, both the U.S. Tax Court and the U.S. District Court would appeal to the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, and the U.S. Court of Federal Claims would, would appeal to the U.S. Federal Circuit Court of Appeals. And obviously at the end, they all appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, which is pretty rare. Um, there's also a small cases division of the U.S. Tax Court, and that's for smaller cases, as you can imagine. Oh, Chris, on that slide, I'll point out one. It, as you can see to the right, it's Federal Circuit Court, but to the left, it's U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. And I think you might have a later slide. There are, what, 10, 11 circuits? There's, there's 12 circuits. 12. So the Federal circuit court was actually uh, the 13th that they added strictly for the u.s court of federal claims um i believe it was added in 82 so okay. it's actually it's fairly new compared to the other courts which so i'll mention later and on a later slide it has less precedence so right. this could be good for a taxpayer if if uh 
if say the other circuit courts already have decided on something, but the US Court of Federal Claims hasn't, then they might be able to actually, since there's no president, they might have a better chance in that court. So if you're, say, at a, at a tax conference and, and there might be an attorney speaking, what you oftentimes may hear is a lawyer cite the Sixth Court of Appeals ruled favorably on some tax issue, but that may not matter to you because you're in a different, uh, one of the other 12. Uh, circuits if you were in Virginia, in other words. So I just wanted to, in case you're, you hear that, you can have different decisions by the different Court of Appeals, but there's only one Federal Circuit Court, and Chris will go into that uh, issue of where you want to bring your case in a, in a few slides. Thank you, Chris. All right. So I'm not going to get too into this slide, but the small cases division of the US tax court, this is basically for, you know, the smaller cases that they don't need a full fledged uh, hearing for. Um, taxpayers make, can re represent themselves. It's an informal hearing. Uh, the judge is usually an experienced tax attorney appointed by the tax court and the uh, decisions are final, so there's no appeals. Then you have the U.S. tax courts, the national court. A taxpayer must file a petition within 90 days from mailing of the statutory notice of deficiency. This is the IRS 90 day letter, as you probably have heard. Um, taxpayer does not have to pay the deficiency beforehand, but interest will accumulate on any deficiency declared. Uh, judges are generally experienced tax attorneys with substantial litigation experience. Uh, there's no jury. It only hears tax cases, so it has a good degree of uh, specialization. Uh, legal represent representation is required, and the appeals are heard by one of the 12 U.S. Circuit Courts of Appeal, depending on the location of the trial. And you got the U.S. District Court. Um, taxpayers must pay deficiency beforehand and then claim, like file a claim for refund. Is a federal court you know, here's all types of cases, not just tax cases. So the judge is not a specialist, a tax specialist. Only court, only court to offer a trial by jury. Um, that could be good for a taxpayer if you got an issue where you think it'd be good to maybe get a little sympathy or something of that nature, but uh, appeals from the U.S. District Court are heard by the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in which the taxpayer resides. Uh, different districts may have different precedents, so the location of a case could be very important. And you have the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. This is a national court. It hears all types of cases involving claims against the U.S. government, not just tax cases. Uh, the taxpayer, once again, must pay defi deficiency beforehand and then file a refund. Uh, there's no jury and the tax and the judges are not special. Yeah, excuse me, specialists. This could be advantageous to bring a suit here. Like I said, if in your own home circuit, um, they've already ruled against uh, cases similar to yours. Uh, and like I said before, too, the appeals are heard by the U.S. Court of uh, of appeals for the federal circuit. So only in, a, like I said, this has been in existence uh, since 82. And yes, that seems like a while, but compared to some of these other courts, plus it doesn't, it hears all kinds of cases. So there's not as many tax presidents in, in this uh, court. So it could be advantageous if your home circuit, you think you're gonna get a bad ruling, you might wanna take this route instead. Then obviously you have the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, rarely do tax cases uh, get to the Supreme Court. If they do, it's usually a constitutional issue on uh, concerning tax. I'm gonna talk a little bit about precedents. I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but stare decisis. Not sure about that, but it I think it's decisive, 
but I'm Decisive. not sure about that either. So yeah. we'll go with that. But uh, it basically means let the decision stand. It's a precedent basically saying courts view own decisions as precedents to be followed unless revisited. So basically the tax court must follow its own decisions, the pertinent U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. The U.S. Court of Federal Claims must follow its own decisions, and it follows the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals in the Supreme Court. Then you have the U.S. District Courts. They must follow its own decisions in pertinent U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. Then appellate courts follow their own previous president precedents in the Supreme Court. All right, I'll get moving through some of this. So basically, sometimes when the IRS loses a significant case, it'll issue an acquiescence or non-acquiescence. Uh, it does not always do this, but it may. Um, acquiescence basically is stating that the IRS will follow the court's decision for for uh, taxpayer taxpayers in similar situations. Uh, non-acquiescence indicates that the IRS disagrees and they'll follow the decision, but only for that particular taxpayer. So in the future, they'll be challenging such cases again. Um, at times, the IRS will agree with only part of a decision and issue a non-acquiescence with respect to certain issues it disagrees with. Uh, of note, occasionally the IRS will change its acquiescence or non-acquiescence by withdrawing the original pronouncement. Um, once again, these are uh, published in the Internal Revenue Bulletin. This is weekly and then added to the uh, Cumulative Bulletin as actions on decisions. So, got into the citation. I'm, I'm just gonna show you some examples because there's tons of different types of citations for all the different courts. But it, I do want to mention it's extremely important that you want to do a citation search. Um, you can use the CCH has one, RIA has one, and Shepard has one. But basically, a citator lists cases, rulings, or other authority that cites the case of interest. This is invaluable as to make sure you're, the case you are researching reflects the latest thinking on the tax matter you're researching. You don't want to research an old case that's already been superseded by another, so it's extremely important to use a citation search. Uh, Rich, Rich can tell you a story about that if you go to his office and ask him about it. <laughs> I put some uh, examples of case citations, like then they're pretty obvious who, which court it came from. Like the U.S. Tax Court will have the TC in it. Um, I put examples of the acquiescence and non-acquiescence, and those are important because if you're looking at a non-acquiescence case, then you might as well not even be looking at that unless you're just trying to. I'm not exactly sure. I, I, I would probably stay away from them, and, and you'd want to tend to look at ones that have acquiescence. I would suspect. Um, but two, you have the U.S. District Court, which is D.C. That's Nevada, obviously. And you have the Court of Federal Claims. And you have the Circuit Court of Appeals. This is nine represents which circuit it is. Then you have the Circuit Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. And then obviously the Supreme Court. Then here, I put this in for reference. The, the format didn't come over quite as well as I wanted, but like I said, you can Google this, put like hierarchy of authority and the, this will pop up, but it gives you a, a good rundown of the different hierarchies within each of the types of authorities. And we get to our last word, exclusion. So I'll give you a sec to drop that into the survey and then we can wrap this thing up here in just a couple slides. Okay, I'm gonna move on. So that's exclusion. 
So step four, you're going to want to evaluate authority. Determine which identified authority would apply best to a taxpayer's position. If authorities are in conflict, determine which authority holds precedent or is of higher authority. Using sound professional judgment is obviously of the utmost importance. Step five, conclusions and recommendations. Sometimes there may not be the single best alternative, so you're going to want to evaluate the alternatives and consider the client's preferences. Uh, client recommendations should always include alternatives. And obviously, once again, you want to be clear and open with the client on his or her options. And probably yeah. wanted in writing. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's on your next slide. Yeah, so our last step, we're going to want to put document in our file. Uh, this is going to be more technical probably, but you want to include all the facts, assumptions, issues, authorities, and recommendations. Um, the letter to the client is more than likely going to be less technical um, in the language. Um, the client should understand any limitations of the research and available alternatives. Once again, be very clear on the facts as you understand them and include all relevant information in the letter. And Charlie brought up a great point. Emailing the letter to the client and attaching the letter to an email is a great way to timestamp your correspondence. That's that way, if the client comes back and says, you didn't tell me about this, you can show them the email that you sent them and it'll be time stamped. So, once again, just want to drop a reminder for Kim told me to bring this, put it in the slide deck that I want to fill out their surveys and submit them with three code words. Uh, I think plenty of people screw this up and Kim ends up having to deal with it. So please do that after this finishes. And lastly, are there any questions, thoughts or comments? I don't see any of the text. So Charlie, I don't know if you see anything. No, not a thing. Thank you, Chris, for a great job and great slides. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you guys hanging out with us um, today. And like I said, I believe the slides will be on the S drive, but also on the link that Kim provided on the website. Um, you can get a hold of the, the slides. I think they're, they're not super in depth, but they can give you a, a quick glance if you need to look something up and when you're doing research or at least point you in the right direction. So. But anyhow, on that note, I think I'll conclude things. And I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season.